long ago, when the goddess Nuwa was repairing the sky. She melted down a great quantity of rock into 36,501 large building blocks. One single block was left unused. It lay at the foot of Green Sickness Peak and possessed magic powers. It could grow or shrink to any size it wanted. Later, a Buddhist monk and a Taoist priest brought this stone into the world of mortals, where, in time, it grew into one of the undisputed classics of Chinese literature, the story of the stone, also known as a dream of red mansions. That laid aside stone stands for both the protagonist of the novel, Jia Baoyu, and the author himself, Cao Shui Qin. by order of Emperor Yongzheng, the mansion attached to the Zhengning Imperial Silk Manufacturing Bureau in Nanjing was raided. For the Zhao family, who'd run the bureau for the better part of a century, it was the end of the line. That autumn, the Zhao family was ordered to move to Beijing. Among them was an unknown 13-year-old. Zhao Shui Qin. When Zhao Shui Qin went to Beijing with his family, the family fortunes were much diminished. Their assets and estates in Nanjing, Beijing, and other places had all been confiscated. Now everything that had once belonged to the Cao family had been handed over by Emperor Yongzheng to Sui He De, the man who had led the raid and taken over the bureau. Sui He De settled the Cao's in a relatively humble residence in Beijing that had 17 and a half rooms. In Beijing, Cao Shui Qin studied in a central government school. There he was taught by renowned scholars and had access to the royal collections of precious works of calligraphy and painting from different dynasties. Thanks to that stroke of good fortune, the young Cao Shui Qin was able to set aside the misfortune that had befallen his family and devote himself to absorbing Chinese culture. Cao Yin, Cao Shui Qin's grandfather, was known as a child prodigy, but Cao Shui Qin was even more brilliant. Of all the notable people who've graduated from Beijing No. 3 Middle School, Cao Shui Qin is considered the greatest. The school was formerly known as the Right Wing School, which along with the Left Wing School was attended by children of Qing royalty. Cao Shui Qin himself once taught at the Right Wing School, and it was probably during that time that he first conceived the idea of a dream of red mansions. This Yuyi Zhongxue, at that time, was divided into five fields. One, of course, was teaching Qing books, which is Manwen. One, of course, was teaching Han books. One, of course, was teaching Chinese books. That Cao Xiaoyin is probably not the case to teach Chinese books. It is the equivalent of what we now think of as art books. That Han books teaching is very intense. 因为汉人的进进士跟举人都会参加这个过过程的，所以曹雪芹要在
这个这种竞争之下呢，他也不太容易这个呃呃抢到这个位置。但是呢，这个亲疏教习呢，就是其他人大概没有他这么好的一个条件。《江陵织造服里面，因为他们是伺候皇帝的，所以满文绝对是他们家族里面必须非常熟悉的第一语言。Among the students of the right-wing school, Cao Shui-chin befriended Dun Min and Dun Cheng, two brothers of royal descent. However, one of their ancestors had ended up on the losing side of a power struggle in the early Qing dynasty, so they were not dignitaries. Both brothers were talented literati and admired Cao Shui Qin's genius. Unsurprisingly, the trio soon became firm friends. From the poems written by the brothers, we catch a glimpse of Cao Shui Qin's personality as well as his life story. Friends, when we describe Cao Shui Qin and Cao Shui Qin, 他有时候也会歪戴着帽子，像王猛，就是后秦苻坚的谋士王猛，就是闷世而谈天下事，那酣畅淋漓、侃侃而谈；有时啊也会喝酒入狂，饥食作歌声朗朗，那种海涛般的激情。这个曹雪芹的感情啊，他的非常丰富。After Emperor Yongzheng's death, Cao Fu, son of Cao Yin, was reinstated by Emperor Chen Long. However, he ran into trouble again, resulting in a second raid on the Cao family. The family would never rise again. The family's final fall from grace meant that Cao Shui Qin could no longer stay in the imperial capital. There was nothing for it but for him to move to the plain white banner barracks in the western hills on the outskirts of the city. So it was that the vicissitudes of fate gave Cao Shui Qin greater insights into the state of society. It was during this period that Cao Shui Qin started to write A Dream of Red Mansions, his magnum opus. He'd only just turned 30. Chapter 5 of the book, when Zhe Baoyu comes to the land of illusion in a trance, he sees a dozen large cupboards with paper strips that says Jing Ling, 12 beauties of main register, supplementary register number one, and second supplementary register. Bao Yu opens the second supplementary register cupboard and takes one of the albums, the first page of which is covered with dark ink washes, representing storm clouds or fog, followed on the next page by a few lines of verse. Seldom the moon shines in a cloudless sky, and days of brightness all too soon pass by. A noble and aspiring mind, in a base-born frame confined, your charm and wit did only hatred gain, and in the end you were by slander slain, your gentle lord's solicitude in vain. These verses reveal the fate of Skybright, one of Bao Yu's maids. When Wang Shifeng, a daughter-in-law of the Jia family, speaks of Skybright, she comments, Skybright is certainly the best looking of the maids. Not only is Skybright beautiful, she's also unmatched in terms of brilliance, competence and sense of duty. One winter, Bao Yu is to attend the birth banquet of his uncle Wang Zutong, for which occasion Grandmother Jia gives him a peacock gold snow cape, which gleamed and glittered and is the last one left. Unexpectedly, the first time Bao Yu goes out in the cape, a hole gets burned into it by sparks from his hand warmer. 
Wang Zetong's birthday banquet is the next day, and he has to wear the cape. So the maids bring it out to be mended. However, the menders, tailors, embroiderers, seamstresses all say they don't know what the material is and don't want to be responsible for it. Skybright, sick in bed, asks to see the cape and sees that it's been woven with peacock gold thread and says, if we could get hold of some of the thread and make a little darn with it, I think it would probably pass. He是带着重病,是吧? 这个情节呢，就是非常充分的写出了情文对贾宝玉的情谊，是吧？他是担心竭力，是吧？不顾自己的病是越来越沉重，怎么也把这个、这个、这个、呃、这个缺金球的褂子给你补好了。Of all the servants in the Jar Mansion, Skybright had the humblest origins. She was brought into the house by Lai Da, an old servant, when she was ten. She didn't know where she was from or who her parents were, not even her real name. Later, Lai Da's mother gave Guybright to Grandmother Jia, who, appreciating her good looks and competence, sent her to serve Bao Yu. Cao Shui Qin depicted Skybright as a servant with a noble and aspiring mind. On one occasion, Bao Yu hurries back to his residence in the rain. When the maids don't open the door for him fast enough, he throws a tantrum kicking the one who comes to the door and calling her names. Then, when he realizes that this servant is Aroma, the head maid, he feels sorry. Meanwhile, Aroma, despite the pain, helps him change with a smile saying he had every reason to kick and scold her, as she should have set a better example. What if Bao Yu had kicked Skybright? How would she have responded? The day after the kicking, Skybright accidentally drops a fan on the floor and snaps the bone fan spines, prompting Bao Yu to call her clumsy. She talks back immediately. You're getting quite a temper lately, Master Bao. Almost every time you move nowadays, we get a nasty look from you. Yesterday, even Aroma caught it. Today you're finding fault with me, so I suppose I can expect a few kicks too. Well, kick away. As head maid, Aroma hurries in to mediate, saying that she knew as soon as she turned her back there'd be trouble. Hearing this, Skybright is angered even more and sneers, I suppose it's because you serve him so well that he gave you a kick in the ribs yesterday. Heaven knows what he's got in store for me for having served him so badly. Bao Yu, so irritated by all the fuss, threatens to expel Skybright and the crisis is only resolved when Aroma kneels down to beg for mercy, followed by all the other maids. Interestingly enough, when Bao Yu comes home at night from a drinking party, he's in such a good mood that he tries to please Skybright, saying that she could tear the fans up if that would give her pleasure. Hearing this, Skybright gladly plays along and tears up two fans. This episode is one of the most iconic scenes in the novel. Of all of 
Bao Yu's maids, the one I like the most is Xing Wen because she, she has some of the qualities of Lin Dai Yu, but she's not so difficult, you know, she's a, a more spontaneous, a very, a very, um, I like her lively way of talking and her lively, her, her character, I just like her character personally, that's all, it's, it's hard to explain. Well, this is a 那种理想主义是吧？青春小说里边呃，特别愿意写到少女，少女的这种纯洁、美丽、聪明是吧？忠诚是吧？这个情商非常高，呃，又很能干，所以晴雯呢，她有这些特点，是吧？呃，另外，晴雯呢，相对来说呢，她和贾宝玉、和林黛玉引为至亲的呢，就是她不管那套，不管我说话你爱听不爱听，是、啊、反正我自己没有没有邪念，没有邪恶的东西，对别人我也没有恶意，呃，所以他他很放得开的，包括对贾宝玉，他也不拍马屁。是吧？跟贾宝玉也可以发脾气，也可以生气，也可以不理，也可以见着贾宝玉回过身去。他是属于这种性格的人。After the discovery of an embroidered purse with an erotic design in the Prospect Garden where Bao Yu resides, Lady Xing and Lady Wang, his aunt and mother. Initiate a farcical raid, targeting every young master, lady, and maid. In the storming of the Green Delights, Bao Yu's residence in the Prospect Garden, Aroma set the other maids an example by opening her own trunks and boxes first. But. When they get to Skybright, who is ill, she simply flung the lid open with a bang, picked the trunk up by its bottom, and emptied its contents on the floor. Embarrassed, Lady Xing's maid explains that she is just obeying her ladyship's orders. At this, Skybright blazes up in fury. Pointing at the old woman, she says, "You say you are here on her ladyship's orders, while、well, I'm here on her old ladyship's orders. Anyway, I thought I knew all the women who worked at her ladyship's place, and I'm sure I never saw a self-important, meddlesome old busybody like you there before." Naturally, Cao Shuiqin and his family could easily relate to Skybright's story. They themselves originated as slaves at the turn of the Ming and Qing dynasties. About a hundred years before Cao Shuiqin was born, the later Jin army, led by Nurhaci, was capturing one city after another of the Shanghai Pass. In his quest to conquer all of eastern Liaoning, one day around the year of 1620, when the later Jin army had just reached a town in eastern Liaoning, two figures staggered among the marching prisoners. Their names were Cao Shiyuan, Cao Shuiqin's great 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 grandfather, and his son Cao Junyan. Father and son survived as prisoners, albeit with a new identity, boy aha, which is a Manchu word meaning house person or boy slave. At the time of the later Jin Dynasty. All ethnic Manchu males and families were divided among eight military administrative organizations called the Eight Banners. 
Members of these banners were civilians in times of peace and soldiers when war broke out. The Tsaos belonged to various banners over the course of 30 years. At first they were under the plain yellow banner before they were transferred to the plain white banner which as of 1651 was commanded by Qing Emperor Shunzhi. So it was that their days serving the imperial household began. Behind all those constant and dramatic changes lay the violent power struggles of the early Qing dynasty in which families were torn apart and people killed. The Imperial Household Department in which the Tsaos served was an official body established in the early Qing dynasty. Knowing full well how eunuchs had interfered in politics during the previous Ming dynasty, the Qing regime considered it necessary to divide and limit their power. Hence the birth of the Imperial Household Department which catered to the royal family's daily needs oversaw issues such as security, rights, engineering projects, silk manufacturing and management of eunuchs and maids and was normally headed by a royal family member or high-ranking official. Shodao,内务府的重要,啊,慈禧后期呢,也想变法立宪,但是他也说了一个前提,有五不义,就是五件事情,变法立宪不能碰的问题。第一个就是清朝的那个中枢机关,军机处之事不能义。第三一个八旗制度不能义一个前提 Since Cao Xiyuan was a boy slave, his son Cao Junyan was one too. However, historical records show that there was more to Cao Junyan than just being a slave. Studies show that Cao Junyan in his youth was promoted for excellence in performance to Zhang Shi or an administrator, an inferior position within his banner. According to another record, however, in 1636, Cao Junyan was accused of bribing his superior with 20 tails of silver. He denied the charge, but was still flogged 80 times as a punishment. Two years later, he received the same punishment. Once again, the accusation was groundless. Those two incidents were on record, while in fact countless other punishments must have been inflicted upon him.
During the mid-17th century, Cao Junyan became a scholar via the imperial examination system. The Cao's had begun a winning streak. Since they had served Manchu rulers before, they were deemed more trustworthy than the average Han Chinese. Cao Junyan was appointed to the magistracy of Shanxi before serving as a high-ranking salt commissioner. Next, Cao Xi, son of Cao Junyan and great-grandfather of Cao Shuiqin, became head of the Jiangning Silk Manufacturing Bureau. For the following six decades, the position became the almost exclusive preserve of the Cao family. During that time, Lady Sun, prior to becoming Cao Xi's wife, was Prince Xuanye's nanny. For that reason, once the prince ascended the throne at the age of seven to become Emperor Kangxi, the Cao's remained in favor with the emperor and his household. Boyson 就农村的命运你知道农财两字是怎么写的吗？这其实也反映出曹金他们家这个包衣身份也是永远不变的。Who, shivering once in rags, bemoaned his fate, today finds fault with scarlet robes of state. In such commotion does the world's theatre rage, as each one leaves, another takes the stage. In vain we roam. Each, in the end, must call a strange land home. These are lines from the famous Wan Don song in A Dream of Red Mansions, and in a way they reflect the fate of the Cao family for generations. Even when they held an important office far from the capital, they had, in truth, never been anything more than household servants to the emperor. In the land of illusion, another maid whose name was found in the second supplementary register cupboard was Aroma. Born into an impoverished household, Aroma's father and brother sold her into the Jar Mansion to be a maid. Thanks to her diligence, she soon became one of the few head maids with a monthly salary of one tail of silver. Once her family's fortunes improved, her brother wanted to buy her back from the Jar family, but Aroma opposed strongly, for she then had a new goal of becoming Bao Yu's concubine. This girl is very 所以你你從他的觀點上,他愛的這個人,他當然當然不願意別人來搶啊,他也知道寶玉除了他以外,丫鬟裡面最喜歡的是秦文嘛,如果他妒忌秦文,也是很人性的。Aroma is inferior to Skybright in terms of both looks and competence. Therefore, to fulfill her goal, Aroma needs something more than just hard work to make up for her lack of talent. In one scene, Bao Yu is cruelly beaten by his father, Jia Zheng. 
Seizing the chance, Aroma says manipulatively to his mother, Lady Wang, I wonder if I might be rather bold and say something very outspoken to your ladyship. Only, I was afraid you might take it amiss, and then not only should I have spoken to no purpose, but I should leave myself without even a grave to lie in. Lady Wang, taking the bait, tells Aroma to speak out, as long as she keeps it between them. Then Aroma suggests getting Bao Yu moved back outside the prospect garden. Startled, Lady Wang asks if he'd been doing something dreadful with one of the girls. Aroma explains that he and the young ladies are beginning to mature. And though they are all cousins, the fact that they are different sexes means that it is natural to feel uneasy about their relationship. The truth is, of the hundreds of young ladies and maids in the Prospect Garden, Aroma is the only one to have had intimate relations with Bao Yu. So it's with a strong dose of irony that she says it's impossible not to feel uneasy given the difference of sex between them. Aroma's bold gambit pays off. Lady Wang, feeling nothing but love and gratitude for Aroma, laughs and says, It is very perceptive of you, my dear, to have thought it all out so carefully. You are a very, very good girl. I am going to place Bao Yu entirely in your hands. In the autumn of 1759, Yin Ji Shan, Governor General of the region south of the Yangtze River and Jiangxi Province, invited Cao Shui Qin to Nanjing to serve in the governor's mansion as an advisor. It was an abrupt decision, seemingly incompatible with his lofty character. There was, however, a reason for his trip to Nanjing. Yin Ji Shan was a famed scholar and politician who held the position of Governor General, despite being just 35. During the mid-18th century, Emperor Chen Lung toured the South as his grandfather had done. Given that the Cao family had received Emperor Kangxi four times, and that Cao Shui Qin was also a famed scholar in the capital, Yin Ji Shan therefore invited him to join his advisory staff as preparations to receive Emperor Chen Lung were being made. As their two families went way back and he hadn't visited Nanjing for over 30 years, Cao Shui Qin gladly agreed. When he revisited the mansion attached to the Zhengning Imperial Silk Manufacturing Bureau where he was born and saw that the massive mansion had been turned into Emperor Chen Lung's temporary residence with its magnificent halls and pavilions, he suddenly felt as if his childhood had become a distant dream. What's more, the great Yangtze River, running by the city of Nanjing day and night, made him feel that success and failure didn't seem to matter that much. But Cao Shui Qin's job in Nanjing was not at all pleasant. In those days, a guest behind the curtain was also known as a literary gentleman patron who helped with advice for a high official or general. Normally, Cao Shui Qin was eloquent and loquacious when expressing himself in writing or speech, yet in the governor's mansion, he was often gloomy and silent. Cao Shui Qin wasn't the only advisor in the mansion, and his impression of his colleagues is clearly expressed in a dream of red mansions. 
The advisors of Jia Zheng were given names like Jian Guang, Shan Penren, Wu Su Lai, and Cheng Ri Xing, respectively homophones for parasite, liar, hothead, and troublemaker. His disdain for them was obvious. But to be fair, the advisors weren't all useless. Cao even had Jia Baoyu make positive remarks about their poems and paintings. Sadly, when catering to their patrons' needs, the advisors would play dumb and act ingratiatingly. Cao Shui Qin who had a strong sense of honor, would never want to live such an obsequious life. As he wrote in the novel, even if they are born in the lowest stratum of society, under no circumstances would you find them in servile or menial positions, content to be at the beck and call of mediocrities. Dun Min Cao Shui Qin's student gives an account of a true event in one of his poems. It's autumn in Beijing, one year after Cao Shui Qin's trip to the south. Dun Min is on his way to visit a friend when he hears a loud conversation next door. One of the voices sounds like Cao Shui Qin's. Pleasantly surprised, Dun Min hurries over and finds that it's really him. It is a joyous reunion that Dun Min simply has to commemorate in verse. A crane in the flock of chickens you are, hearing your voice fills me with passion. Suddenly we meet again, vigorously we shake hands. Increasingly I feel life is as fickle as the floating clouds. Cao Shui Qin, resenting the life under someone else's roof in Nanjing, returned to Beijing's western hills, where he committed himself to the writing of a dream of red mansions. Ai Xin Gyo Ruo Fupang, his cousin and a grandson of Cao Yin, was the prince of a commandery, which meant Cao Shui Qin could easily move up the social ladder. By that point, however, nothing could distract him from his devotion to literary matters. In a dream of red mansions, Skybright fails to find a place where she feels as if she belongs. After establishing that Skybright is a young flibbity gibbet, Lady Wang, Jia Baoyu's mother, comes to the Green Delights in a raging tempest and drags Skybright, who hasn't eaten for five days, off her sickbed and has her expelled from the Prospect Garden. <laughs> Uh Bao Yu has absolutely no sense of hierarchy. For him, even the lowliest maid, if she happened to be kind and outstanding, could be a saint in his eyes. He says on one occasion that he knew something awful would happen when he sees that half of the crabapple tree in the courtyard had died. All the paragons of the vegetable world, such as the juniper tree in front of the Temple of Confucius, the milfoil that grows beside his tomb, the cypress in front of Zhuge Liang's shrine, the pine tree that grows in front of Yue Fei's grave, had withered and dried up in times of disorder, only to flourish once again when better times came round again. His outburst is received immediately with a rebuke from Aroma. Comparing Skybright with all those famous people, 
what sort of creature do you think she is anyway? And even if she is so wonderful, you seem to forget that I have precedence over her among your maids. When Bao Yu takes a risky trip to visit Skybright on her dying bed, she's pleasantly surprised, whimpering as she holds his hand. It can't be more than four or five days now at the most. If it weren't for one thing, I could die content. I know I'm a bit better looking than the others, but I've never tried to make up to you. Why will they insist that I am some sort of vampire? It's so unfair. And now I have so little time left. I ought not to say this, but if I'd known in advance that it would be like this, I might have... After that, she chokes and speaks no more. Later that night, Skybright passes away.所以他说要跟贾宝玉换袄清文死了对Yu hears from a little maid that Skybright didn't die, but went to heaven to be a flower spirit, looking after the hibiscus bushes and lotuses, which were at that moment blooming in the prospect garden. Bao Yu, whose sorrow turned instantly into delight, points to the lotus and says with a smile, such a flower is worthy to be looked after by such a person. In Chinese culture, Lotus is a symbol of the virtuous soul. Bao Yu composes a long poem in memory of Skybright called The Spirit of the Hibiscus. It is now 16 years since the blessed spirit descended into the world of men. It is to be recorded of her that in estimation she was more precious than gold or jade in nature more pure than ice or snow, in wit more brilliant than the sun or stars, in complexion more beautiful than the moon or than flower. I by my rosy misted casement seem most cruelly afflicted, and you beneath the yellow earth seem most cruelly ill-fated. The tears of Runan fall in bloody drops upon the wind and the complaint of Golden Valley is made to the moon in silence. It's very moving, I think. Though the bond between us was a slight one, yet can it not easily be broken. And because she was ever close to me in my thoughts, I could not forbear to make earnest inquiry concerning her. Thus it was revealed to me that the God had sent down the banner of his authority and summoned her to his palace of flowers, to the end that she who in life was like a flower should in death have dominion over the hibiscus. At first, when I heard the words of the little maid touching this appointment, I thought them fantastical, but now that I have pondered them in my heart, I know them to be worthy of perfect credence. The spirit of the hibiscus stands out among nearly a hundred poems in the book. 
Not only does it demonstrate Cao Shui Qin's brilliance as a poet, but also functions as a kind of ode to all the anonymous common people in Chinese history who've displayed nobility of character despite their humble birth. Cao Shui Qin, who lived in humiliation all his life, was yearning for an ideal world, a heaven for wonderful people like Skybright. Yang 而且有几句话完全就是把行文的严格抬到跟屈原那样的一个高度同时呢通过寄情文也表明宝玉对行文之间的那种感情是纯洁的清白的又有像晴雯这样的能感所以《红楼梦》他写了一个那么肮脏 The so-called Golden Age that encompassed the reigns of Empress Kangxi and Chen Long was in reality a turbulent time. In Cao Shui Qin's magnum opus, every word is soaked in blood. But the important thing is that the author offers his readers a ray of hope, however faint it may be. It's that quality that makes the book a timeless classic.